Hey guys, it's me Jack, and I'm back with another review. Today I will be reviewing the third film in the Jurassic Park franchise, Jurassic Park 3. Despite the fact that Lost World wasn't nearly as well received as the first movie, it still made a profit, and so naturally they decided to make a third movie. However, this time the movie wasn't directed by Steven Spielberg, but instead Joe Johnston who, to his credit, is a very good filmmaker, directing films like Jumanji, Captain America the First Avenger, and The Wolfman. When the film was released, however, not only did it perform less well at the box office than even The Lost World, but once again, critics and audiences were not too kind to it, with many labeling it as the worst one yet. And it killed the Jurassic Park franchise for 14 years. So the question is, is it really as bad as all that? Well, that's what I'm here to determine. The film centers around Alan Grant. Yeah, remember him? He was kind of absent in the last movie. Who is having trouble getting funding for his digs. However, hope arises when a seemingly rich man named Paul Kirby approaches him and offers him a shitload of money if he will be their guide as they do a flyover of Ila Sorna. Grant agrees, only to realize that their plan was not to fly over the island, but instead, to rescue their son, who was stranded there eight weeks earlier. When it comes to this movie's characters, Alan Grant coming back is a welcome addition. Sam Neill, for the most part, still does a very good job, although there are a couple of line deliveries where you can tell that he's not really that invested. Though, honestly, I can't blame him. A controversial plot development in this movie was the decision to have him and Dr. Sadler break up. The film begins and we realize that Ellie Sadler has married another man and had children with him. I'm of two minds about this. On the one hand, yeah, it does make the ending of the first movie feel kind of hollow, when we know that they aren't going to get together in the end. But on the other hand, that is how life is sometimes. Sometimes things just don't work out. Sadly, unlike in the first movie, there isn't really that much of a character arc for Grant in this film. You could argue that there is a mini one regarding him and his assistant Billy, realizing that Billy was not a bad person and was trying to do good. But that isn't really that much. There's the characters of Paul and Amanda Kirby. And what can I say about them? Well, they suck. William H. Macy is a good actor, but this film's script gives him nothing good to work with, and his performance just comes off as, well, flat. Also, he's a total hypocrite, because in one scene, he's telling his wife Amanda to not scream for their son, Eric, as it might attract dinosaurs. But then literally one minute later, he's doing the exact same thing. And speaking of Amanda, she's even worse. When she isn't talking in a stale, boring voice, she's screaming so much that you just want to put yourself out of your misery. And the whole relationship between them is just so hard to get into. Once again, this is mainly due to the acting and the script. You have that cliched moment near the end of the film where Amanda thinks that Paul is dead, only to realize that he isn't. And the acting here is so bad that it comes off as more of a parody than an actual serious moment. But if you think that was lame, just look at the scene afterwards. It's this painfully forced moment of the family thinking back to the good old days. Paul tells them about the time that they went fishing, and a tow truck driver tried to pull them out of the water, only for him to get pulled in. And he wanted to knock their lights out. Yeah, that's a nice memory worth bringing up. And just like that, Amanda loves him again. The character of Billy, Dr. Grant's assistant, is pretty decent. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, he's one of the better parts of this movie. A criticism I've heard about this movie is that there's no human antagonist, and honestly, I see that as a positive. Billy is technically the closest thing we get to a human antagonist, as he tries to steal some raptor eggs. But he does explain that he was just trying to do it so that they could keep funding their digs. Not because he wants to be rich and famous, but because he just likes digging for dinosaurs. He states that he did it with the best intentions, and this leads to probably my favorite line in the movie, from Dr. Grant. Some of the worst things imaginable have been done with the best intentions. Which, I mean, is true, just look at Peppa Pig. 
There's a nice moment afterwards where Billy sacrifices himself to save Eric, and he gets attacked by Pteranodons, and they have to leave him. Following this is a nice moment between Eric and Dr. Grant, where Dr. Grant talks about the difference between astronomers and astronauts. The astronomer studies things from afar, so that they can be safe, while the astronaut wants to look at these things up close and in person, despite the danger. Dr. Grant was the astronomer, Billy was the astronaut. Unfortunately, however, this heartwarming moment is kind of ruined by the fact that Billy isn't actually dead. He turns up at the end of the film, and he's okay. He's injured, sure, but he's still alive. And the thing is, apparently, originally he was supposed to die. But the actor that played him was just not happy with that, and so he kept pestering Joe Johnston, the director, to have him be alive. Until finally Joe Johnston gave in. And it really sucks, because I think it would have worked so much better if he did die. It may be very overused, but the storytelling trope of saying something mean to someone who's a friend of yours right before they die, and then not having the chance to apologize, is quite effective. And they had that going here until they just ruined it. The character of Eric Kirby is probably my favorite new character in the movie. Hell, he's probably my favorite kid character in the entire Jurassic Park series. Not only does Trevor Morgan do a very good job playing him, but he isn't just someone who constantly needs to be saved. He's quite resourceful, and smart, and sometimes he saves other people. Even when a pteranodon picks him up and takes him to its nest, he doesn't just sit there waiting for the adults to rescue him. He makes a run for it. The other human characters aren't really much to talk about, so let's move on to the dinosaurs. Now this movie, like the original Jurassic Park, with the Velociraptor, launched a dinosaur into worldwide fame. However, here it was done in a pretty controversial manner. That dinosaur is, of course, the Spinosaurus. Before this movie was made, it was discovered that the Spinosaurus was actually bigger than the tyrant lizard king himself, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And so the creators of this movie decided to make him the star of Jurassic Park 3 instead of the T-Rex. Now honestly, I'm not against this idea. The T-Rex is awesome, absolutely incredible. But we have already had two movies with the T-Rex as the main dinosaur not to mention plenty of movies beforehand. So giving another dinosaur some time in the spotlight was not a bad idea. If the T-Rex didn't show up in this movie and it was just the Spinosaurus, I honestly would have been fine. But no, that's not what they did. The T-Rex shows up for a couple minutes, has a fight with the Spinosaurus, and that fight ends with the Spinosaurus breaking the T-Rex's neck and killing him. Okay, ignoring the fact that this fight is pitifully short, killing off the most popular dinosaur was an absolute insult. Whenever I do watch this movie, I always just skip over this scene. It pretty much brings nothing to the plot at all, and was only just there because the filmmakers were so arrogant and thought that they could just kill off the T-Rex and everyone would just be fine with it. This scene has launched a never-ending debate on which dinosaur is better, and which dinosaur would actually win in a fight, the Spinosaurus or the T-Rex. Now, I am not really one to engage in this kind of stuff, and I think it's important that we all just respect each other's opinions and acknowledge that there is no real definitive answer as to who the true king of the dinosaurs is. I'm just fucking with you. We all know who the real king of the dinosaurs is. I can see your whole history in your eyes. You were born with nothing, so you've had to struggle and connive and claw your way to power. But true power, the divine right to rule, is something you're born with. The fact is, they don't know which one of us is going to be sitting on that throne and which one is going to be bowing down. But I know, and you know. Well... You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. 
You were never even a player. Oh yeah. Suck it, Spino fans. Disclaimer, this is a joke. If you like the Spinosaurus better, that's totally fine. Okay, but seriously, controversial scene aside, the Spinosaurus is pretty cool. I really like its design and its roar. It has a good presence to it. I love the scene where it just totally wrecks their plane. There is admittedly, however, a really stupid moment with it. And that's the moment when you realize that it has swallowed the Kirby's satellite phone, but the ringtone of the phone can still be heard from inside its stomach. Okay, look, you can make arguments about the plausibility of this, but even taking that out, it's just stupid. It undermines what is supposed to be a scary moment. The Spinosaurus does come back once again during the climax, and it's a pretty exciting moment. I love the setting, this lagoon in the middle of the night, during a thunderstorm. There's even a nice little homage to Jaws with the Spinosaurus's fin coming out of the water. Sadly though, they couldn't even let this scene be without adding something stupid in there. During this scene, Alan is trying to call Ellie Sattler, and we keep cutting back from this intense action scene to Ellie's son at home watching Barney the Dinosaur. That's right, Barney the Dinosaur is officially part of Jurassic Park. Thank you, Jurassic Park 3. Thank you. We also have the return of the Velociraptor, and it would seem that the raptors have a completely different design. And I gotta be honest, I'm not a fan of it. The mohawk on the top of the head just looks goofy. And I get that it is scientifically accurate that raptors had feathers, but if that's the case, why not just go all the way and have the feathers all over the body? The raptors make their first appearance in this movie in easily the most stupid scene in all of Jurassic Park. On their way to the island, Dr. Grant falls asleep and has a dream that there's a raptor sitting across from him that says his name. It is the stupidest shit you can imagine. This is something I'd expect to see in the Jurassic Park Lego game, not one of the movies. Still, I do appreciate that this movie does continue to show that the Velociraptors are very intelligent creatures. I like the moment where they set a trap for our heroes and almost manage to get them. We also get the Pterodactyl, which was only briefly seen at the end of the last movie. And the sequence with them is pretty exciting. I especially love the moment where the one pterodactyl just looks back at our heroes and gives them that very threatening stare. Though it is kind of stupid that at the end of the movie the pterodactyls escape and fly towards the mainland, and our heroes just don't give a shit. Unfortunately though, there are some dinosaurs that are really wasted in this movie. Like the Ankylosaurus. There's this moment where Billy is calling for Alan, and then it transitions to a shot of a bunch of ankylosaurus walking. Like, what the fuck was the point of that? Just to say, hey guys, we did it! We finally put Ankylosaurus in these movies! Yeah, but we'd like to actually see them do something. Another dinosaur that is wasted is the Ceratosaurus. This guy has a really cool design. But all he does is just walk up to our heroes, take a sniff at them, and then walks away. What was the point of this? Remember the Compsog Nathuses from the last movie? Remember that awesome scene that they had with Dieter Stark? Well, here they are in this movie, just catching flies for a couple seconds. Still, I can't deny that the special effects are once again very impressive. The plot for this movie is pretty weak. It's pretty much just a simple rescue mission story. Nothing more, nothing less. The setup alone is really stupid. The stepfather of Eric, Ben, thinks that it would be a great idea to take his stepson parasailing right next to an island filled with dinosaurs. An island that is, you know, restricted, as the movie spells out to us right at the beginning. What could go wrong? This whole opening scene is one of the worst I've ever seen for any movie. Ignoring the very bad green screen, the attempted suspense of the scene that they're going to crash falls flat when you realize that they aren't actually on the boat, they're up in the air. At least in Lost World, they had a better reason for going to the island. 
Hammond needed them to go down there in order to protect the dinosaurs from the company. Here, what sets the plot into motion is just some idiot parasailing next to an island that he knows is dangerous. So right off the bat, it really kills my interest in this story. Taking that out of the equation though, the film just doesn't really do that much new with the story. It's basically just Lost World, but shorter, and with a Spinosaurus in the place of the T-Rex. It's clear that during the script writing process, the filmmakers realized that the plot was really bland and generic. So they thought, how could we take this in a new and interesting direction? Oh, I got it. Let's just throw in a new carnivorous dinosaur that's bigger than the T-Rex and have them kill the T-Rex as a way to raise the stakes. It's extremely lazy. The film is also only 90 minutes long, which really makes it stick out like a sore thumb among the other Jurassic Park movies. And it really shows just how little they cared. I know that's very mean to say, because I can tell that there was still a lot of effort put into this movie. Movies are very hard to make, after all. I'm talking mainly about the studio. They really just wanted to get another Jurassic Park sequel out there, regardless of its quality. So many of the scenes in this movie are just so rushed in their pacing. From Grant finding Eric, to him reuniting with his parents, to them finding the satellite phone, and the ending, which is incredibly abrupt. The military just shows up out of nowhere and gets them out of there. As for the soundtrack for this movie, it's not nearly as good as the soundtrack for the first two movies. This time it wasn't done by John Williams, but by Don Davis, who did the Matrix movies. Which, to be fair, have some great pieces of music in them. There are a couple of nice new themes in this movie. Particularly the theme for the Kirby family, which almost makes me get into their relationship. Almost. So at the end of the day, do I think Jurassic Park 3 is a terrible movie? No, absolutely not. Do I think it's a good movie? I wouldn't say so. It is... what's the word I'm looking for? Mediocre. Thank you. Mediocre. It can be genuinely entertaining. There are some great action set pieces. The special effects are impressive. And when looked at in isolation and not as a part of the Jurassic Park franchise, it's honestly a lot better. But it is a part of the Jurassic Park franchise nonetheless. And for that, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. Thanks for watching, and join me next time for my review of Jurassic World. I'll see you then.